Alrighty, next up, Kyle Morton with the U.S. Fish, Fish and Wildlife Service. Talk titled, Postdoc and Mortality and Behavior of Age 1 Lake Trout in Lake Ontario. Thanks for the intro. Uh, again, my name is Tom Morton. I'm a biologi biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And today we're talking lake trout and telemetry. Before I get too far in, I do want to uh, thank this massive list of folks who made this uh, project possible. Uh, sincerely, uh, every time I look at it, I'm like, oh, this is kind of ridiculous. But everybody here uh, was instrumental in getting this, this project off the ground and making it feel seamless. Um, and then all these collaborators, uh, they, they make it feel like we're all just working in the same office. So it's, it's, it's a really great experience dealing with this many people from this many places and making it as seamless as it is. Um, so to just jump right in and kind of give you a little background on Lake, uh, Lake Trout in Lake Ontario, uh, I'm sure a lot of us know already, especially sitting in it uh, to many of the talks this week. But uh, Lake Trout once supported a harvest, uh, a really big harvest for commercial fisheries in Lake Ontario. Uh, and this harvest crashed um, in the uh, mid-1900s for various reasons. Uh, starting with commercial fishing, obviously humans have a great way of taking just a little too much. Um, habitat degradation, uh, we all know that there's a lot of uh, climate change that's causing lots of different problems with our reefs and with nursery habitats and things of that nature. And then lastly, invasive sea lamp rate. Um, and it's, so it's all kind of like this combined mix of, of problems for Lake Trout. So they've had a really tough time persisting in Lake Ontario. Um, so moving forward, just talking a little bit about what the rehabilitation plan is for Lake Ontario. Uh, since 1973, uh, we've used hatchery reared Lake Trout to try and substantiate an adult uh, spawning population. And uh, it's honestly done a really good job in Lake Ontario to an extent. Um, we're kind of just missing one little key component for uh, saying that hatchery reared lake trout did the job that we wanted them to do. So if you look at the figure on the right from O'Malley at all, uh, we can see that uh, catch per unit effort is, is really good in some situations. And even when there are dips, it's still, you know, you're catching a lot of adult fish. But if you look at the bottom, uh, there's not a lot of unmarked fish. We're not seeing a lot of wild recruitment in the lake. And so these hatchery individuals seem to be raising into adults very well. Uh, folks are seeing them exhibit spawning behaviors, but we're just not seeing that return of wild individuals in the lake. Um, and then just to kind of tie in a little bit at the end here, uh, so of course we're using these, these hatchery reared lake trout, but we're also going through, currently right now, if you listen to Ryan's talk and Lucas's talk, uh, we're doing a lot of habitat quantification. Uh, in Lake Ontario right now to also try and get a baseline and, and see where we can make changes that will hopefully increase early life survival. And so that kind of transitions me over to where our management targets are right now. We're kind of in a unique spot uh, today uh, and basically this year. We're kind of shifting gears a little bit. Uh, we focused a lot on adult survival and, and obtaining a, an adult brood stock, but we're also now kind of identifying again, we're, we're seeing lots of adult fish, but we're not seeing a lot of wild fish, so there must be something going on in these early life stages that's causing us uh, to not see these wild recruits. So we're kind of shifting gears into identifying and evaluating uh, lake trout spawning locations, again for early life survival, uh, to assess what's going on there and see, okay, is it a habitat quality that we could really uh, hone in on that would likely increase our recruits. Additionally, we're looking at uh, different impediments on early life survival, and but I want to tie into the end here. Although we're shifting gears, we're not going to forget uh, to continue assessing our lake trout population dynamics and monitoring our adult stock. So what this project is is we're kind of aimed at uh, looking at post-stocking survival, as the title suggests. But we've also uh, we're kind of taking hold of a little bit of new technology here. And we're looking at what role predation plays in these survival estimates. And then lastly, uh, kind of joining in on some weird caveats that we've seen with bloater. Uh, we're interested in, in seeing if stocking these fish at three different treatment depths, uh, 5 and 50 and 100 meters respectively, uh, and seeing if that also has uh, an effect on our survival. So uh, this is like 
a beast of an acoustic telemetry array. It is so awesome, and we are very fortunate to have everybody involved in getting something like this together. And so you can see on the left side here, of course, the blah. We are over in Oswego, New York, on Lake Ontario. And something I want to point out a little bit here, so uh, the black dots are one type of receiver, and the uh, pinkish dots are another type of receiver. And I'll talk about that in just a second. And then those three stars that you see, those are our stocking depths. Uh, the southeast star at 105 is our 5 meters, and then 72 is our 50 meter, and then uh, 39 is our 100 meter stocking set. Um, so, again, I said we had two different types of receivers. Uh, you can kind of see in this mess of receivers that we have while we were out deploying the array um, that we have green receivers and blue receivers and small green receivers. Um, but so what I want you to focus in on are these uh, big green receivers. Uh, those are high residency receivers and they operate on a slightly different wavelength than we're used to. We're looking at uh, 180 kilohertz fish, but we also are also seeing um, or listening for 170 kilohertz transmissions as well. Um, and so what we get out of utilizing these newer receivers and these uh, you know, different wavelengths is that we're getting higher detection rates. We're hearing more fish when they're clustered together, um, which, of course, if you can imagine, we're stocking 100 fish out into the lake at a time. Uh, we need some receivers that have good ears. And so just moving forward a little bit here, uh, I have comparisons from a little bit of preliminary data from our HR receivers, high residency receivers, uh, with our PPM, which is pulse position, or position pulse module um, detections. And that's what you're normally looking at when we're talking about telemetry. Uh, so on the left-hand side, um, we have the high residency, and these are all detection, number of unique detections in a 10-minute window. So there are some instances, which is where we stopped the fish in, in May, uh, where we were getting over 150 detections every 10 minutes, which is fantastic. Meanwhile, uh, if we stuck to the old, uh, well, I say old, but it's a still reliable way, but if we stuck to the normal way of, of listening for these fish, uh, you, we can clearly see that we're going to be missing a lot of detections and that this is panning out for us. Uh, so moving forward, how are we tagging these fish and where were they from? Uh, the Allegheny National Fish Hatchery has been rearing the broodstock, or excuse me, rearing the, the yearling lake trout, and so we just went to the hatchery and we were tagging them there and they helped us out with uh, selecting the individuals that we were looking for. We did have a minimum size selection of 14 grams. Um, if you're a little familiar with acoustic telemetry, you do have to bias it a little bit for a minimum size selection because we have to worry about tag burden. Um, if we're throwing a, a you know, ginormous tag on a small fish, of course we can't expect that fish to behave normally or uh, be a good representation of the rest of the population. These fish also did get a random assignment of a gill biopsy, and this was for a lot of genetic work with the fish that I'm not going to try and get into. And then again, we were using 180 kilohertz transmitters, um, and these were V5s, and so I'll show a picture in a second of the size of these tags. Um, and then just to add up as well, we, we stocked about 130 lake trout. Uh, so this is a, a lake trout getting one of these tags put into it, and you can see like, that's the full size of the tag. It's just barely getting into the fish now. So that's another beauty, uh, beauty behind the 180 kilohertz is that the tags are made much smaller than what we would normally see. Um, and so the tag burden is, is minimized in these cases, um, increasing our confidence that these fish are behaving like we would normally want to see them. So jumping right into it, we've got a little bit of preliminary results here. Unfortunately, all of those HR2 receivers with the high residency tags uh, we did not get good data off of. We had a pretty nasty malfunction in the software. Um, so we was about two weeks away from having all the beautiful data that I was just talking about in our talk. Um, but nonetheless, we still have a great array without those HR2 receivers. And so I'm going to just give some pre preliminary results going forward. And so the first thing, what everybody was interested in, is survival. So on the x-axis, we have time and days. And then on the y-axis, we have survival probability. Uh, do note that these tags uh, live for about 78 days to estimation. We did see some detections afterwards, but while I was assessing survival, if I was questionable about the fate of a fish after 70 days, 
Um, I just censored that, that fish and, and couldn't feel confident whether or not it actually had died or if it, the tag had just died. Uh, but amazingly, you can see we had some really good survival uh, initially, um, given that we also didn't detect 15 fish. Those 15 fish weren't detected, we assume, because that HR2 array down the middle. Uh, we don't have any data for that, so there's kind of just a black box there. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks we can figure out what happened to those. We also wanted to look at the survival and compare it among those depth treatment groups, and we did not see any difference. Um, although this might, you know, this, this glaring red box over here is just a matter of low sample size by the time we get towards 80 days. Moving forward, these fish were stocked with the predation sensors, and interestingly enough, we only had two fish that were predated, and that was 65 and 71 days post-stocking, uh, which is really interesting. Our, our bloater that we also are stocking into this array unfortunately see a much different fate sometimes. Uh, so it's nice to see that these lake trout are surviving at least almost all the way to the end of the project. And now I'm going to shift gears a little bit into space use. Again, this is all preliminary. We're going to be diving in a lot deeper uh, once we get our high residency data. But uh, basically, we're just assessing how well this array works for our questions. And so again, we have time on the x-axis and days, and emigration probability on the y-axis. And so these are just Kaplan-Meier time to event models. And we could see that by the time all of our tags die, we still have approximately 50% of our fish in the array. Uh, which is really helpful for us to be continuously monitoring them as long as we can before they leave and we don't have any idea where they're at. Um, again, just talking about the lack of that HR2 data, uh, some of our fish, their last detection was quite literally a week after we stocked them in, and then some of them lasted the entirety of their tag life. And looking at emigration uh, compared among the depth treatment groups, again, we did not see a statistical difference uh, between that. So they all seemed to relatively stay in our array normally, uh, which is a good sign as well. And so what is the importance of this project? Why are we doing it? And uh, how does this potentially affect management decisions down the road? Well, as we saw, our lake trout have a relatively high survival. Again, once we get that high residency uh, data, that survival is likely to take a dip just based on the lack of information for those 14 fish. Um, but our results are really good already, and we know this as well because we're catching a lake trout from the hatchery already. Um, and then something that I'm really trying to hone in here on is that um, when we're shifting gears to that early life survival, I want to also suggest that, you know, based on the survival of these stocked fish going in at age one, it doesn't seem that predation on these age one uh, life stages is really going to limit our wild uh, or our adult recruitment. Um, so it's suggesting that something a little earlier in the life stage is causing uh, the lack of wild recruits. And a little teaser as well, we're going to be looking at barrel trauma when they're stocked in the deeper waters. Um, our, we, there are some groups out there that found um, <clears throat> barrel trauma to potentially be uh, a limiting factor on stocking bloater. So we're also curious if lake trout suffer the same device. And just to quickly go through, uh, we're looking to do this, replicate this for 2024 in the spring. And then in 2025, we're going to spruce it up a little bit add some more treatment groups and how we're stocking these fish to try, kind of play around with where we're seeing survival and um, how we can limit predation on these, on these fish going in. And with that, I'll take any questions.